You need a bit of slapping sometimes. Oh. That's the... Dirty boy. Naughty boy. Naughty boy. Naughty boy. Naughty boy. Naughty badger. <laughs> Did you just release something? No, I was hoping you were going spank me, but then no. <laughs> Welcome back to the Badger Den, Arcanauts. I'm here with Anders Brandt and James Thompson to discuss the inner workings of the brand. How are you doing today, Anders? Good. James? Good. I'm a little nervous. I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to say before I get fired. So we might have to keep a bit of a tight lid on this. I don't think we're going to fire you. I think we kind of need your ingenious take on watch dial design. That's called bargaining position, ladies and gentlemen. Write that down. So talking of Instagram and how things have changed, we know that the algorithm on Instagram platform has shifted considerably since you had your, I would say, heyday of accruing followers that got you up to 40,000 peeps back in the day. But what else has changed since you entered the business in terms of how the market works? And this could maybe go back to what we were saying about the post Kickstarter era. So maybe attack it from that kind of angle. I would say it's more... It's a more important question for you because you've been in the game for longer and maybe also you. Maybe. Well, yeah. yeah, Rob's the elder statesman of things here. <laughs> for me, I would say when Kickstarter and stuff first came into the game, it was what was really exciting was that it was democratizing manufacture. Mm. You didn't need to have a $3 million CNC machine to make cases. You could actually bring in all these different little projects and put it all together. And I think the problem was that it over democratizing you didn't need to take any ownership of your manufacturing process i got somebody who does that oh we need this i got somebody who does that so it was almost like every design agency it was like a fucking temp agency mm. nobody had any skin in the game everybody yeah. was just sleeping on somebody else's sofa and i think now that there's been there's been some brands that have been very successful out of that of course but i would say the the wine has been watered down so much by the, this is the watch Switzerland doesn't want to, you to hear about crowd, that I, I, I think the more social media presence you have, I almost start to see that as a, uh, what are they hiding? Do they just, can they just not do anything else? Like, why are they so big on, you know, it's like now if you see somebody that has 200,000 followers on Instagram, you're like, Ugh. Oh, that's interesting. That raises, that all about? raises a lot of interesting points, actually. I mean, you're absolutely right. There was that era of have a go heroes where people would just throw ideas at Kickstarter, as, as you mentioned earlier, um, just renders. Mm. You know, no real investment of time or money. Did you say have a go heroes? Have a go heroes. That is the greatest name I've ever heard. <laughs> it's perfect for Kickstarter, right? No, I'm gonna put that over the door. <laughs> well, you see, you're more than a have a go hero, but these people, <laughs> these people were just seeing what stuck. You know, they threw a lot of darts and they hoped they hit a bullseye. They just yeah. basically had their eyes closed, or maybe they they read a lot of books about what would be successful in the market, and they tried to play it by numbers. And you can see through those brands. At least we can see through those brands. Yeah. But. It, vast swarms of the buying public who had never known a democratized watchmaking industry before were taken in by that and yeah. they backed a lot of those projects and some of those projects were decent they turned out sure. decent watches for the money and the kickstarter fee was i believe between five and ten percent you know i think it varied over the time but it was still favorable to go b to c for the first time and you could get guys working out their garage and have great success mm. and then you got to the era of professional kickstarters mm -hmm. where you see somebody that's on their 10th kickstarter project interesting isn't yeah. it that's that, an interesting way of see, raising capital that's when i really tuned out on the whole thing yeah i kind of feel like there's a there is actually scope for that kind of platform to exist but it shouldn't have been kickstarter it should have been something yeah, else agreed i think that the closest thing to it maybe is watch angels run by uh, guido benedini the former uh, head of frederick constant um oh, i didn't know that or is it Alpina? One of the two. I always forget. Um, he uh, He's established this effectively crowdfunding platform that enables watch brands, but genuinely good watch brands with good ideas, mm. with, with good design principles to come through the ranks and to have a platform that uh, they can be sold upon. And I think that is the right thing for that kind of business. That's like an old-time industry guild. You're You're using the the industry, the society, to lift up everybody. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic idea. And if that could exist outside of the slick Kickstarter rendering 
aspect of things that absolutely sort of sticks in my throat, then that's, that's brilliant. And that can only help the next generation of the industry. Of course, now we're in this, as you've termed it rather poetically before, post Kickstarter era, where, and maybe especially because of COVID and the separation people have had from the physical world, the desire to see a real product is really palpable now. Yeah. And that causes problems even for brands like us. Yeah. Yeah. Because although we have a creativity, we have real products out in the world, a lot of the new stuff that we are experimenting with because of its highly experimental nature is not really possible to make before the fact. We kind of have to say, this is our idea. We're on a developmental process. We'd like you to come with us on the journey, but we need them to trust us. Yeah. Now, we're establishing that trust throughout the community. People that know us, people that have bought from us before are buying again. But do you see that as maybe one of the major stumbling blocks in the next development phase? of I, I would say one of the things that I would like to get to in the future is that we can go from idea to prototype in a much shorter duration. Mm. So we can actually go from saying, well, I have this idea and then we have a functional prototype in a week. You know, that because I think oh, that's the we, sexiest thing I've ever heard. That's just <laughs> fantastic. If we can get a process going, that that's, you know, a lot of the things that, that I'm, you know, thinking about is how can we get to that point where we can go from the idea then to actually yeah. having the functional prototype and having a wrist roll with something. Because you learn two things with the prototype. You learn you know, how to actually make the stuff. And then you learn also if people are interested in actually buying it. So you get two of the same things. And if you can do the prototype and the sample cheap, uh, you know, cheap and fast, because usually the problem with prototypes is you, it's hard to just make one single unit of anything. Yeah. You know, if you're, especially if you're dealing with something like CNC machining, then just the setup of the machine mm. is going to cost you a lot. So you need to make a certain amount of units for that to make sense because that's what you're paying for, basically. It's the setup and the machine time. Yeah. And if you need to pay, let's just throw out a random number, like 50,000 US dollars just to the setup, then it doesn't make sense to just do like one single unit. Mm. Mm. And there's an additional wrinkle to that as well when it comes to working with more experimental materials. Because right now, all of our cases have been made from steel. But in the future, we might want to experiment with new materials that themselves are not off the shelf. Yeah. And if there's something that requires a heavy investment for a material to be made specifically for us, and then you've got to add that into the CNC setup, you know, you really kind of have to roll the dice and say, we're going to make 50 pieces of this. It's the only way to do it. We might as well make 50 if we're going to make one. And then... And that's a big bank roll because yeah. that, those 50 pieces, the amount of cash you need to out for that, you need to be certain that those 50 pieces sell. And if it's only one or two pieces, then you're basically gambling the <clears throat> future of the company on one single, one single model. And that's actually what... If you look at what happens to most companies that you know, go bankrupt or, you know, most co companies in the watch industry, it's one of two fails of some series where you get too comfortable yep. and then you're like, well, we can sell anything. You know, I'm not sure. You don't hear the ice cracking under your feet. Right. You get a little fat and lazy and suddenly you're middle of the road and nobody cares anymore. I'm not sure that it always comes down to comfort. I think sometimes it comes almost out of necessity. And just to take a, a working case study, one of the brands I talk about all the time, because they're one of the few that actually transitioned from Kickstarter to being a viable brand, and that's Laventure. And there was a point oh. quite recently when Laventure transitioned into having its, its own proprietary caliber made for it by Chronode, where it stepped up from bought in off the shelf movements, most of the time hidden behind closed case backs so that the decoration wasn't an issue. They basically mortgaged the entire company's success up until that point on the sellout of that model because the development costs of that movement were so extreme. And that was an extremely stressful period for him because it's a one-man band, just one guy doing all the design and all the sourcing, all the contacts, everything. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, just, just him. Okay. He does one release a year, every June. He releases a new model. And that was a roll of the dice that he had calculated from day one. He had a plan. He knew that it would take that many years to get to the point where he'd have the money to go for that, and he went for it. Now, if it had failed, 
goodness knows what he would have done. I mean, that would have been the end of the brand. You absolutely mm-hmm. right. But isn't that more respectable than the Kickstarter? It is. I'm not going to put my own skin in the game, but if you could put a bit of your skin in the game, yeah, that that is true. You but you need a balance, right? Sure. You need to you you need to make sure that the skin in the game you put in it that there's also some customers on the other end. Then it can be few customers even because we know if we you know send out a, a sketch or something to a certain group of customers and ten of them mm. wants it, then there's a a larger group that will buy. If it works as a barometer a really well. If if we have our, our sort of 10-person focus group, we can call it that, and, you know, w- all but one of them go, this is, guys, no, nice, but not for me. Mm. That gives us a pretty good indicator of how we think the market's going to react to it. Talking about the market and how it's moving at the moment, something I want to ask you specifically, Anders, is, how you feel about the move away from what we took for granted throughout COVID, and that was immediate sellouts. So you have a model that's limited to a certain number, especially if it's limited, it would go in a flash, it would go in a heartbeat. We're seeing special editions of 100 or more pieces sell out in minutes or even seconds. And we kind of got to feeling, oh, that is... I I know that drives you (laughs) mad, but from a watch production perspective... A couple of years back when this was happening all over the shop, it was heaven. Because you basically knew, okay, we limit this piece to 100, we release it, after building up people into a frenzy for a few weeks, it's a guaranteed sale. Yeah. Now the watch market is stabilizing. The bottom has dropped out of the secondary market, even Rolex prices are coming down to somewhere more like you'd expect the secondary market prices to be. We're seeing brands release special editions that are hard-capped, limited, not selling out immediately. Some taking days, some taking weeks, some taking months. Some still sitting there. And people are shocked because we got so comfortable mm. in this idea that, oh, that's how it works. But that thinking was never right. It was never how it should have been. Mm. Now I, it's reverted to that. What do you think? Do you want to do a first Can on I this? touch on that first of all? You can touch on it. This is <laughs> something that's really always bothered me. And I'm, I don't want to sort of step on any toes with this, but there's been a couple projects that I've been involved with prior to Arcanaut, that were all about the limited edition. There's only going to be a hundred of these. Maybe there's only going to be a thousand of these. And as the press release is going out, it's sold out. And I'm, I'm thinking, it's like fucking Taylor Swift tickets where the whole concert sells out in 20 seconds. Mm. I get it. Mm. But when it's a limited series like this, and they're like, it releases at 8 o'clock in the morning, and by 8.03, we've sold 5,000 pieces. No, you haven't. There's been so many instances of well, yeah, they're all sold out, but we also contacted our distributors two months ago, and they agreed to buy 800 units, 600 units, 300 units. So it's, I don't want to say it's disingenuous to sort of have this, your stuff has to sell out in under four minutes, or you're going to die pouring alone. Because that is just setting unrealistic goals for everybody except for if, if, Patek Philippe announces they're going to do something like what MBNF did with the Mad One series. Mm. Those would be gone in five seconds. Mm-hmm. I get it. Mm. But when it's normal brands, it seems like they're twisting the numbers a bit. Is it a good way to build a brand, though? That's an interesting question because you think, oh, rapid sellout. I mean, again, look at Laventure for the first four or five releases. Well, actually, first release took whole Kickstarter campaign, didn't actually entirely sell out. Second release took three months to sell out. Third release took three hours to sell out. Fourth release took three minutes to sell out. And that For real. Last one took minus three seconds. No, and then the one after took about a month. So it's gone back. Well, wow. it's, a thing, it's a thing that, I, you know, that we talk a lot about and, and think a lot about because, of course, you want to sit. Like, the good thing about selling out the first day and then it's done is that then you can you can start manufacturing and no. you actually know how much you need to manufacture and you get the economies of scale you know, everything is set and you have a deadline for when you need to order things and then deliver things. Uh, the thing that you're talking about, about is that it good for the brand? Yeah, I think it's a good thing that there's demand for the brand, but is it really good long term mm. that the people who are buying into a brand is might not actually be really interested in the brand? Right. Yep. That they actually haven't done, you know, the due diligence and actually thought about the purchasing decision and they're 
totally in love with it. Mm -hmm. And then, mm. then you have most of the people that have actually bought it. It's just people that, you know, I don't want to flip it or mm -hmm. are like uh, people that are not really in love with it, but just want to buy it because other people want. And flippers are basically the anti-Arcanaut customer. There couldn't be anything less Arcanautian than that's a flipper. That's exactly what I was thinking. So if I can, can I pose a question to you? How would you feel about a Arcanaut X swatch collaboration piece like the Moon Swatch or the Blanc Pan? Or... Well, that is interesting because when when the the first swatch maker came up, I actually thought it was an interesting idea because it's something I new that it. nobody has had seen before. Now it's totally redundant because people stand in queue, yeah. you know, for multiple hours just to get a watch that's not limited. And they're going to flip it. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 I look at a lot of these projects as sort of like a, like a court case. Does this thing deserve to live? Does this thing have, does this project, <laughs> that's a little dark. Right. Does this so project just... have the right to exist? And the moon swatch I thought was dead cool. Um, I was actually going to buy one for my wife, but she said she didn't want it. She got an Apple watch instead. Well, when it come to the new one, it was kind of like, okay, well you just know. By the time you see the second Avengers movie, there's going to be like six more coming because there's all the cameos and stuff. So there's, I guarantee there's going to be multiples of these whatever brand X swatch collaboration. And I think it's lost the magic already by the second project. Mm. So when it gets to be, I mean, God, think if you get on an airplane, just so you know, this is Airbus X swatch. Mm. Like, oh God. I'm just going to get off and take the bus and sit. Mm. Hopefully they make better planes than they do smart cars. That's for well, sure. There's that. <laughs> uh, talking about design choices, I, although I do think that a bioceramic Arcanaut would be pretty cool and uh, pretty comfortable on the wrist. We can float it by Hayek next time he's in the building. Um, originally, when you started out, the Arc 1 had a really clean Scandinavian aesthetic from the outside to the inside of the watch. But then you got a little bit wild when this reprobate came on board what motivated that shift did you feel it was necessary to bring the case to life or was there something else behind it it was actually because because like going from the arc one where we manufactured things in switzerland and going to the arc two where i knew i needed to take things back to scandinavia because of the economies of scale and the, the companies we work with in switzerland needed to have you know needed me to order 500 pieces at a time mm. which i knew okay that that's not a yeah, that that will kill the company in in a couple of years because then it's one failure and then it's done. Yeah, then it's one series that that's you know not going to. It's your buddy rolling the dice. Yeah, repeatedly, and that's. And I knew, okay, I need to first of all get you know we need to make <laughs> dials in another way because the way you manufacture dials in Switzerland is not something that's possible in Denmark. So we needed to actually design ourselves out of that problem and figure out a way to do dials in a totally different way. So when I thought about that, then I thought about James and I was like, okay, I need to, I need to get James on board and I don't want him on board just as a, you know, project partner, a black badger Arkanaut. I actually want him on board as a part owner of Arkanaut. You don't want to be a guest star all the time. And, yeah. and I think, you know, uh, usually when I get a thought like that, I act on it immediately. So I had that thought and then I immediately went to Gothenburg, yeah. had a beer with James and proposed to him. Only one beer? <laughs> That's not what I remember. <laughs> proposed to him like this partnership, like won't, wouldn't you want to come on board with Arcanaut and start the next big thing in the watch industry? That was kind of my proposal to you as it were to you when I had the opportunity to do the same yeah. here. So I think, you know, the design had to change because the manufacturing processes had to change. And then it was an open opportunity to do something different. And I think the design now, even though I love Dark One, it's still, you know, one of the greatest watches in the world, in my opinion. Hey, hey. But <laughs> pop, pop. But I think the the platform we have now is much more sustainable because it's a great merger of something that nobody else is doing in the industry, which is clean Nordic design made in Scandinavia. And then it's with something different on the dial. It's 
diff play with the different materials, I usually call it contained madness. Yeah. You know, and it's the perfect merger between, you know, the Arknaut and the clean Danish design and the Black Badger madness. Was this the first time you'd been asked to join a company? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it surprised the crap out of me. I, I, I was sincerely, genuinely touched by it. Because there was, I mean, previous to this, you know, I, I was this kind of perennial guest star. I, I would parachute into a certain brand and make a bunch of noise and a mess and then kind of screw off and go do something else. And you start to kind of feel like a, a bit of a design ronin that just doesn't have a home. And I'm like, what's going to happen when I come around full circle and I come around knocking on MBNF's door again saying, hey, hey, do you guys want to do another? There's nobody else left. Hey, do you still yeah. like me? You know, like it, it, you just start to feel like a bit of a vagrant wandering around. Do you think that the uh, natural successor to your crown as a wandering minstrel is uh, Ramaric Andre, second second? Because he's now collaborating tirelessly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That guy, that guy produces. Yeah, he puts out, he puts out the work, and it's still. I I, would, I don't want to overstate it. Everything I see him put out is so fresh mm. and is so novel and is mm. so. Not just funny, but more like witty, and I think wit is far more important than funny, um, because it 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 sort of surprises you a bit. You know, like a YouTube video of a cat falling down the stairs is is maybe funny, but it's not witty. You don't mm. it doesn't sort of strike something within you where you go, okay, I see what you did. Okay, crap, that was good. That mm. was good. So that's something he does really well. Um, but back to the previous thing about well, sort of finding a home at Arcanaut, nobody had ever offered. Uh, if they did, I don't know if it would have been right. Because I'm thinking if I would have been absorbed into pick a brand, I'm always referencing MBNF. Yeah, so let's say MBNF. Yeah. MBNF, sure. I would be eating at their table. Right. So I could go as crazy as I want, but at the end of the day, it's still Max Booster's watch. Mm -hmm. Bloody well should be. So there's always going to be a bit of fitting yourself into somebody else's environment. Whereas with Arcana, both our working relationship and physically putting the weird crap that I do into your case, that's the perfect metaphor because we both have to maybe make little changes of ourselves to not end up shooting each other across the bar at some point. But I think that contrast of the very clean, very architectural Scandinavian design on the case with the goofy drunken art student stuff that I put into it, I think that contrast between the two is something that is quite quickly become quite iconic within us. So if we just put out next week a really nice clean watch with a really clean somber dial and a clean somber strap, you know, it, it might sell really well, but I know that we would just be bloody miserable. Yeah. It. Well, I mean, we've had the discussion in house, haven't we, about yeah. doing yeah. it, and it, it didn't make it off the drawing board. No, I was a total dick about it, I'm sorry to say. I don't remember your attitude. I certainly remember Anders' attitude about it, yeah. And yeah. Uh, fair, fair play. For was that when the neighbors started principles. banging on the wall to stop yelling? Yeah, uh -huh, I think yeah. it was something like that. Quite possibly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, from the outside looking in, though, Arkanod looks like it's a lot of fun. But what percentage of the, the time spent together is fun and how much of it is actually very serious? Mm. I That's guess good. your answers might be different here, actually. Mm -hmm. I would say... <laughs> A lot of, uh, I try to keep things fun, but things are not fun when you need to be uh, very realistic about things. That's actually, I, I would love to have somebody who could just be the CEO of the company and be the realistic one and actually s say, okay, guys, we need to make some money because that is, you know, that has also become my role. <laughs> and, mm. and it is to be very realistic about things. So sometimes I'm, you know, I, I'm not, I, I usually, I'm not positive always, you know, mm -hmm. I would love to be positive. Well, you're Nordic. Yeah, that's true. Like I, I'm all, always seeing the, it is raining and, and things are not enough for me. And, you know, we need to do, you know, more and more and more. And I think that's maybe just part of my personality, but when I'm up here, but you need that because otherwise you would be the happiest guy in the unemployment line. <sighs> if you were running around being goofy like I am as a business, 
the three of us would all be sitting around talking about, you know, which construction site we worked at or something. It would be a total different game. It so is, there needs uh... to be the madness. And I wouldn't say the madness needs to be contained, but it does need direction. Mm. Like, I, mm. ideas are like a field of grain. On their own, they're just fine. Unless you take them and process them and do something with them, it's just wheat in a field. You need to actually take it and make the bread, make something out of it. And I think that's probably the most important role in Arcanaut, because otherwise, realistically, I could do the goofy stuff I do anywhere. Mm. I, I, I could do it for any company, but it wouldn't matter as much. I think the way we've sort of set up things amongst the three of us is that it needs to be our three different personalities banging heads against each other all the time, because what we've seen is the result that comes out of it. Mm. It's pretty fucking special. Yeah. So there does need to be a little bit of back and forth on that. Yeah, yeah I think uh, also I would imagine that the, the fun and seriousness, they go in waves, right? I mean, like, mm. there's a process where, you know, everyone's got their creative hat on and it's, you know, for you guys, like, specifically designing the products, like, for me, more like an overview of product development over years and, like, what we need to fill and how you guys are going to fill those commercial requirements yeah and then like stuff gets serious because we got to sell and, and you, you, you know you stay away from the realism as much as possible because that's not that's not what is really your but i have it thrust upon me yeah if, every so often if i may have things yeah. thrust upon me when, every so often stuff has to be so made it. it's like because obviously it yeah. comes from you i will say the the four die dial because we got buckets of four die around us here mm. the first time we showed one of those dials we just lost our minds it was absolute <laughs> creative bliss and then it was like okay we need 40 of these <laughs> i was like crap because it was to get that first one it was for me it was capturing lightning in a bottle this should not be able to exist like this mm. and then it was like do it 35 more times and i was like i don't ever want to do this again but <sighs> but you have found a way no, I just don't bitch about about it. <laughs> on, I do, we've seen the results. I do my bitching in this room. These walls are caked in bitching. And blood. And then... Uh, <laughs> and blood. A little bit of that. Um, I lost where I was going with that. Might be all the Fordite dust. Yeah, no, the realism. and The, re uh, the know, realism I, is, is very much an important part of but it. But we have fun. Like, let's be honest. Like, when, oh, we're, all, when we're all together, we have a lot of fun. And if... If we weren't, if it wasn't fun to make watches, and then why even do it? Like yeah. I think you need exactly. to have a have a have a job that also has that element where you can be passionate about it. But I think looking in from a lot of people, it's they see their hobby and then they're like, "Well, uh, that must be super fun." <laughs> Yeah, because like I would love to be, you know, that guy just inventing watches and doing mm -hmm. this, and you know, I can I, I can get that, and then it, every day must be super fun. But realistically, even if you made, you know, ice cream every day, it's gonna be a, it's a job. It's yeah. a job, and it becomes a job. But it, it need still you need to have the passion for it. I had a friend who got an internship with Ferrari, and it was like he's like sketching cars unbelievably talented and after a while he was like hey you know what i did today i drew red cars oh yeah you know what i did yesterday i drew red cars <laughs> like it sounds like the most unbelievable thing but when you have to do it day in day yeah. out anything sucks true but we did choose this as our job yeah. and yeah. you know all jobs have that element of repetitiveness and strain and uh, you know and and you gotta love it, and it, it's gotta be fun because else there's a lot of other things that we could do yep. that would be you know meaning more meaningful in terms of what we could make and more meaningful in terms of like business wise because watchmaking is not like a great business, no, it's, <laughs> and it's, it's very not. nuanced. It's very hard but, to um, understand. But it, what I find interesting, as you said, like you know, as an elder statesman or whatnot. 20 years in the industry i've never worked so closely with two people doing two such very different jobs within a brand that is entirely defined by their output and it's interesting to watch you guys go through a different gamut of emotions because i'm a very black and white realist to be honest and i have the advantage of it not being my baby that this is a brand that i 
as soon as I learned of it, wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to, you know, cool. get on board with and like be, you know, walk the same steps with you. But nothing will change the pressure that you will always feel personally because of what it is to you. You know, it is you. You are the brand. Like the case is your work, and that is something. It's interesting for me because I can sort of step back a little easier from it and be like, okay, well this is a situation and okay, that's pretty scary. Or, you know, we have to make this watch at this time, or we have to fulfill this order here. But there's, you know, I have that fortunate sort of separation, whereas I can barely imagine sometimes what it's like for you because, and it's maybe similar to what it's like for you when you get a comment that you don't like online, because that's your work, your, your blood, sweat and tears. It literally mm. goes into creating a product that's out there. And so does it keep you up at night? Does it stress you out? Does it affect your relationships? I, I think I've gotten a lot better at it. it at, actually, at the, when we launched the, the first Dark Matter, I was out for three months with stress and uh, basically wow, so, really? totally, uh, yeah. totally out, yeah. out of the game. A lot of people don't know that, but I was so stressed about, you know, delivering the watches and, you know, not, now we had the success and now we need to deliver. On top of that, what we experienced was that, you know, uh, a lot of things also went wrong behind the scenes, you know, uh, in the, you know, the manufacturing, the production, everything, and the realism got into it. But I've gotten a lot better at managing the stress. I keep out of, you know, uh, I, keep, I keep out of social media. I, like, manage that to try and keep out of it. I don't read comments and reviews. I try to keep, like... I try to stay out of actually reading, you know, watch magazine, watch industry things, because when I have free time, when it's the weekend, I don't yeah. want to think too much about work mm. and I don't want to think about watches there. Like when I am at the office, you know, uh, on Monday, then I'm back in the game, but I'm really good right now at compartmentalizing. And I also need that space to be creative and to actually do the next things. God, I'm not good at that. No, me neither. I'm very impressed, actually. Uh, but that's... You do know, you tunes. read watch magazines? Do you no. belong to a bunch of watch groups? No, Facebook? no, no, no. no. Absolu I belong to absolutely zero. I, and I think it's because I need to keep whatever little thing we've found that works, I need to jealously guard that and put that away in a safe. Because I think if I read 50 watch magazines a month, I'm going to start to be a little tainted and a little affected by that. And that's going to start to influence what I do, what we do. And it'll slow you down. That's what you said to me once. Plus, I don't well. know how to read. If, yeah, nobody's surprised by that. But <laughs> it, was, it was a scything comment that stuck with me. And I, I took it as like great advice. I think I was, I was encouraging you to be more patient about something. And you said, if I was as patient as you, Arkanaut wouldn't exist. And I thought, no, there's, ooh, a, real, there's a real truth pew, pew. to that. Because... I've been in this industry for 20 years. Yep. I am a watchmaker. I always wanted my own brand. Do I have one? No. And I thought there's a reason for that. And it's as you've often identified, like I'm so deep into it. Mm -hmm. I'm so infected by everything else that's going on. It's almost uh, paralyzing. You know, it's hard to move. It's hard to know where to go, how to be creative. And I have ideas. But how much of them are my own and how much of them are assimilated from other people's stuff? And that's what you two have got that's very special. Well, it's the burden of knowledge. Mm. This is, we can say, God, wouldn't it be awesome if we, you know what? I bet you nobody else has made a case out of bronze. Mm. <laughs> and, and then you would go, okay, okay. There have been one or two moments like that. Actually. Yeah, right, that's, well, a, but, that's a fair point. But in other yeah. words, because we isolate ourselves in the work and you've seen it from the outside, like the sort of macro level of the industry, you can say... Okay, in theory, you know, someone did that. Four brands did that, and they went tits up last week. Very funny. We'll do something. Else. I have sat in the pit in Copenhagen and watched Anders basically design a watch that took the watch world by storm when Vianney Halter made it twenty years ago, and he was like, <laughs> "Look at what I've just designed," and I was like, "Yeah, don't need to tell you this, mate." Let's warm up the lawyers. <laughs> no, but it's, yeah. it's it's a very interesting point, and of course. The, the the naive advice for you would be like go and read, do the research, learn the industry. But that's knowing, the knowing that is I I like I'm I know that. Like that's what I'm here for, like that pivot point, whereas you guys should not do that. Yeah. Mm. So we need Anders to not be on the inside of the watch industry. It's this blank map kind of thing we talked about before. Mm -hmm. The moment that we can chart what you're doing 
And the moment you start doing what the industry does, we're, we're totally ponied. We're done. Mm. There needs to be, and I don't want to sort of insult you by saying being naive about it, but we didn't go to woe step. You know, I don't come from a watch design background, and I think it shows, and I think it needs to keep showing mm. because that's what makes it fresh and unique. But, but that's also why the company exists. Like you say, you, you know, if we knew too much about the industry, it would never have been. It yeah. would have never existed. Like we started the company, my, me and Simon, my, uh, my old partner in the company who I started the company with, we started it basically on a couple of beers where we said the next day, okay, we're going to start a watch company. Yeah. And it's that naivety. <laughs> that's what we you know, did too. <laughs> that that's basically you know uh, you need that na naivety you need yeah. impatience as well because i i think i'm very impatient towards myself and my goal because because i'm never satisfied mm. like even you know this year mm. we know from the inside we've had a lot of success and we've had some major you know uh, like we should uh, you know, celebrate for, for some of the things we have done this year, but I'm never satisfied because I look two, three years ahead. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, and I now. don't, and I don't. <laughs> so <laughs> thank God you do. Cause I don't want to go back to work in construction in downtown Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> but like, Shout I, out to I, I look at what I, I believe Arkanaut can become in eight years mm. and in 10 years in 20 years and what the vision is. And then I'm like, well, even though we did this this year, we are going to go here and to do that, we need to do double as much next year and double as much the, but, the third year. But do you think, going back to the sort of Kickstarter, post-Kickstarter, post-Post post Malone era thing, do you think that a lot of these kind of pop-up companies have the same view as Anders does about, I'm glad we had success today, but what I'm really interested in is what we're doing five years, so what are we doing 10 years from now? Like, is there a sense of legacy or a sense of gravity to anything? I mean, the easy answer and probably the most general answer and the most accurate is absolutely not. Most gotcha. of them are just trying to perform a cash grab, get yep. as much as they can, as quickly as they can, and then disappear into the night. Generally speaking, it's quite rare these days because watchmaking in terms of longevity is something of a closed shop, at least it has been. There haven't been many brand new brands started post quartz crisis they've had immense success probably the most notable era around that era would be something like hublot yep. you know it's, it's an established right. brand it didn't exist before the quartz crisis it was it was one of the vanguard of, of new brands and it, it built itself based on a inimitable or at the time seemingly inimitable usp and it has really gone on to become a cornerstone of the industry i think Strangely enough, Arcanaut is in that vein in some way because of the way that it looks at materials and the way that it takes a completely sideways perspective on watch design. And I think it's... That's interesting. Most, most brands, most young brands, they say, you get five years of cool. You might have heard this. You used to spend a lot of time at Salon QP exhibit and you've been there as well. It was something we used to talk about all the time. It was cool five years ago. It was cool five years ago. I was it was cool. cool. Five years ago. You were cool five years ago. It... It's funny, like, take a brand like Seven Friday. Perfect example. Perfect. When you were displaying in the old days with Max and whatnot there, Seven Friday was at its absolute zenith. Yep. It was incredibly successful, extremely visible in every magazine, uh, sponsoring every event. It had had its five years of cool. Then they tried to do the C case, and then they tried to do, like, a D case, and they tried to do a different type of case. Yeah. And now they've got this 3D printed model, which is kind of cool. But the thing is, Seven Friday had one thing going for it it was a tv shaped case yep. it was 47 millimeters it was bright colors it was a bit of rubber on the outside of the case it had its moment and it skyrocketed up the charts it had its five years of cool and then thip, and like realistically now it's starting again and they're doing a pretty good job with the 3d cases i like them very much but they basically have to make a new brand because from the ashes of the old one that's that's all they have a hope of existing in 50 years time now what you're doing is you're starting off not really focusing on five years of cool. You're not thinking, I'm going to enter this industry, I'm going to make a lot of noise, then I'm going to get a lot of cash, and then I'm going to out the window. You're thinking, I want this to be a brand that I give to your kids or James's kids or some random kids that you meet on the street. You know, you, you, you want it to be something that exists beyond you. 
And that's rare. So that is rare. The post Kickstarter era yeah. is hopefully time for that to become a thing again, where people start companies that are supposed to last. But right now, there aren't too many of them around. We don't need to go as high and fast. I think Seven Friday is a absolute textbook example of this. Because you could walk into Mad Gallery in Geneva, and they had... That, that was the first place I physically saw Seven Friday watches alongside a friggin' 180,000 euro legacy machine of MBNF. It, it was ridiculous. But it fit in there because they both were cool as hell. Yep. Mm. Um, and actually... On, on the Seven Friday front, I, I was actually wearing a Seven Friday the first year I exhibited, uh, helped exhibit at Salon QP with our mutual friend Giles of Schofield because we only had one black lamp watch and it was in a really excellent looking case with lights on and stuff. And I was there kind of helping out in the booth. I'm like, oh, do you have a watch for me? He's like, well, we only made one. Okay, so I was wearing a Seven Friday. And actually, I think Giles was getting a little sort of grumpy because everybody was coming up going, what's that? What's that? <laughs> like, oh, it's a 7 Friday and everybody wanted to talk about this and people were taking pictures of it. You definitely what? should have taken that off. While I'm standing <laughs> next to them. Well, I wasn't sort of officially exhibiting. I was more just loitering, I guess. But, but it, it, it was an interesting, uh, interesting paradigm on it because it wasn't really doing anything to try and change the game, but it just had that kind of... Dean Martin, I'm not trying to be cool, and that's what makes me it so cool. It had a stick. It had one mm. thing. It, it had did a stick. Thing well. And that and that had a, a, a great story arc to it. And if they're able to reinvent themselves again, then I, I think they absolutely deserve it. On that note, when is Arkanaut going to appear in Mad Gallery? You've got the contacts. <laughs> You've got the creativity. Coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Max, you heard it here first. I'm um, coming for you, big guy. Make some space. Chair us, please. Jimmy T's getting on his horse. Okay, so we talked about... Do like, you think it would fit in somewhere like Mad Gallery? Absolutely. Obviously, price category is massively different, but the but mentality it behind it, I think we're absolutely kindred. I 100%. have no doubt whatsoever that it would be an absolute hit with the people that frequent Mad Gallery. I mean, mm -hmm. let's face it, if Seven Friday was there, Arkanos got all the, all the credibility it needs to be there. What I'd like to see is an enormous Arkanaut clock on the wall of Mad Gallery. Oh. Always want to see your case done as a clock. Ooh. Uh, that would be the heaviest clock in the history of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of those giant bell towers. Okay, let's wrap things up there. Thank you for either listening or watching this podcast. If you are watching it on YouTube, then please feel free to leave some comments in the comment section below. Nice ones, please, for James's ego. Please, please. please. Uh, if you'd like to find more content from us about the brand of Arcanaut, then visit our website www.arcanaut.watch and you'll be able to find links to all of our social channels there. We really appreciate you spending the time with us here today in Gothenburg from the Badger Den where all the magic happens. Stay safe. We'll see you next time. Now go watch Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast? Yeah. <laughs> My kid likes him. Mr. Bean? Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean. No. Right. Oh, right. What? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>Hi and hello, Arkanauts, and welcome to a very special edition of the Arkanaut Records. I'm here in Gothenburg with Anders Brandt and James Thompson in the Badger Den, where the Black Badger works his magic. How's it going, Anders? Come all right? You're a Muppet now. It's <laughs> going <laughs> uh, It's going very well, yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh, jeez, Miss Piggy, I didn't realize you were going to talk to me first. <laughs> but I had a girlfriend. <laughs> She'd kill me, Mr. Simpson. Oh, okay, that's all the sillies out. Okay. <laughs>